Star Trek movies, lost money. People watch Star Trek? I thought it was a really good movie, but Star Trek movies have been losing, an, on an average, for Paramount, the studio that produced it, on average $30 million per movie. And they're paying an annual fee to CBS to license the property of Star Trek, which is upwards to about $10 million per year to, be, to keep exploiting that property. So why does that happen, and why are certain big movies not successful, and why are certain smaller movies like It, if I don't know if anyone's seen It, if they've been uh, abroad, that movie made $150 million on its first weekend, and that movie was made for about $6 million. So but we'll start out with who are making movies. So as you know, the, there are the big six studios in the U.S. that are the largest film companies. Okay, so we call them the big six, or they're sometimes called the majors. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about why they're called the majors, and that's Paramount, sorry, my writing is terrible, Sony, Fox, it's called 20th Century Fox, but I'm just going to use a abbreviation, Universal, Disney, Warner Brothers, I'll just write that as WB. Okay, so these are called the big six. And then there are other companies out there that some of you may know about called Lionsgate or Legendary that was just bought by Wanda or uh, Studio 8 if you're kind of a little bit more knowledgeable about the companies out there. Th those are, are going to be called the mini majors. Okay, these companies collectively, well, well I'll just write them out. Legendary is definitely a mini major. Um, Lionsgate. Studio 8, there are a lot more of them. And uh, arguably, a lot of people would con include the company Studio Canal as well, which is one of the largest distributors in Europe. So collectively, we call these the studios, OK? And what does it mean, the studios? Literally, it means they have film studios, traditionally. All of the big six have lots. So if you go to ever visit uh, the Burbank lot of, for example, Warner Brothers, you'll see they have all of these giant sound stages because traditionally they were built as production facilities. They didn't necessarily finance the movies because if you made the movie, if you shot the movie in the past during the, the birth of Hollywood, usually you'd be the one paying for it. Nowadays, we usually treat the studios as banks. You can think of them as banks because what they do is they pay to make about 15 to 20 movies per year. They can be of all sorts of sizes like Star Trek to Mission Impossible to um, anything that you see a logo, and I'm sure most of you would recognize the logos of these companies. When you see that logo come out, that usually means that companies pay for almost 50% of the cost to make that movie. It also means that this comp the film is likely shot on the studio lot, so on one of the sound stages of these facilities. And also means that these are the companies that distribute. So the studios usually will be the financier, and distributor, okay? So what does it mean to distribute a film? It's literally just to make sure to do door-to-door -door sales to all the local theaters in all the cities in all the world, knock on their doors and say, this is our film, here is the DCP, the, doc the document you need, the digital file of the film, and this is how many screens I want you to commit to it, and this is how we're going to share in revenue. So it's to get the film into all of the screens. So the, the process of distribution is very labor intensive because you can imagine there are 35,000 screens in the major cities of the US. There are 49,000 screens in China. Okay, and there are about 2,000 different um, exhibit, we call them exhibition companies, so theater, theater chains in the world. And Sometimes when you have a big one like AMC, you may have the luxury of dealing with the head of North America at AMC. You can then get a distribution deal for all of North America just by knowing that person. But for most individual theaters, you need to literally go and talk to the theater managers. So you can imagine the labor that that entails. And that is why the big six average, on average employ about 2,000 to 3,000 employees worldwide. That is why also they're the most powerful and they have the most money and they have the most influence in what and who gets to make a movie. 
So these are the studios. Now, the studios, you can think of them as banks because while they pay for everything and while they distribute everything and while they sell everything, they're not the ones actually making the movie because the producer is the person who go out and goes out and makes the movie. Okay, so the producer, what they do, there are six things you can do to be a successful producer. One, you can know a lot of actors or a lot of directors. We call them talent. Okay, so you know all these people. You know what they want. You know what their quirks are. You know what kind of stories they like. And you've read a lot of books. You know who the publishers are. You know what may be the next successful YA novel out there. A good friend of mine named David Heyman who's based out of the UK, read Harry Potter because he knew the publisher of J.K. Rowling, who was about to publish this book. Two months ahead, he sent a rough draft to my friend David. He read it, and he bought the rights to it for $20,000 before it was even published. And then, lo and behold, it became a huge, huge hit. And that is why David Heyman is the producer of all the Harry Potter movies. And the other is he himself may also have some money. A lot of producers actually come from a um, business background. So this is why I'm going to assume all of you guys are going to be the future golden producers who are going to make the best movies out there possible and sure as hell make better movies than what Hollywood is offering now. I'm going to write production. What this means is they really have a lot of time and expertise on their hands. They know how much a car costs that will take the, the production equipment from the rental place to the studio, they'll know how much an actor's fee should cost. They know when the gas and electric bills are, are completely inflated. They'll know how many you know, caterers to hire. for These guys run the production. Okay? They're that kind of producers as well. So these guys, these particular set of skills enable you to really do what we call producing. And what it really is, is you're just throwing a party and then you're inviting all the people and then you're making sure that the party has a nice house and a nice environment to, to, uh, to be fun. So the producer puts the movie together. Usually what happens is that you, as a producer, you have a book that you like. You know the publisher, let's say, if you're someone who goes through, through the IP route. You would then option the rights to use that property. And now you you're in business. You have a legal document on your hand that allows you to adapt this property into a screenplay. And then you take that to screenwriters. And there are a lot of agencies out there. So I'm going to just quickly go over another important business out there. So talent agencies, OK? The, the big ones are CAA, WME, and UTA. So you'll go to any one of these agencies who are the managers and agents of writers, other producers too, directors and actors and actresses. You approach them and say, I have this screenwriter who is really, really good at adapting Harry Potter. And then what you're going to do is you're going to go knock on all the doors of these guys. And one of them is going to grant you money. Okay, that is the quickest way to get a film made usually, um, is if you have IP on your hands. Now, there are certain producers who are very close to a particular director. So for one example, Ridley Scott, who all of, I'm sure all of you know, he's the director of Gladiator. He did Alien, Alien Covenant, all of those movies. Mark Huffam is a producer on a lot of his movies. That's because Ridley got to know Mark really early when he was 39, finally getting into film business. Mark was a production manager in the UK at Pinewood Studios. He was the one who ran all the production, uh, all the productions that Ridley did. Even before he turned into a film director, Ridley directed 2,000 ads as an advertisement director before he came into film directing. So the two are essentially partners. So it's very easy for Mark to go talk to one of these guys and say, hey, Ridley wants to make a movie. Why is it important? Because he's made a lot of other successful movies. So as a bank, if you really treat these guys as a bank, they have a, a a valuable asset on their hands, even if it's completely intangible at this point. So all these studios, when they f do a deal with the producer, usually they'll do a financing deal. Okay, So they'll do a deal to finance the development, production, and distribution of the picture. So this, I, I can't write on this. Okay, so this goes into the lifespan of the picture. So first stage of filmmaking we call development. So 
This starts to happen as soon as a producer has any one of these. Maybe less so production, but if you have, let's say, $1 million on your account and you can do whatever you want with it, the first thing you're going to want to do is either talk to directors or writers to see what they're working on. Um, sometimes writers will write things on, on their free time without being paid. We call this a speculative spec script. Um, they'll have tons of these things. Or you scout out the next IP, uh, or you, you read novels, you read short stories. Now you're starting to see movies like, I don't know if anyone is on Weibo or uh, looks at BuzzFeed, but you see real events are becoming IPs as well, uh, like the Brother Orange incident where a guy named Matt Stapina, who is an employee of BuzzFeed, got his phone stolen in Brooklyn. That phone got then sold on the black market, and then it ended up in Guangzhou, China. And then this weird guy who loves taking selfies of himself in front of a bunch of orange trees starts posting photos of himself using that bootleg phone that he bought in China. And lo and behold, he never disconnected the iCloud account. So Matt kept getting photos of this weird guy and, and a bunch of oranges. And he starts reposting all of this on BuzzFeed. It's the weirdest thing ever. It becomes internet sensation. And then a bunch of people pull a bunch of funds together to get Matt over to China to meet this guy. And that itself is also video blogged. We call that the Brother Orange incident. There's a guy working on that. If you guys know the movie A Fish Called Wanda or, um, or uh, um, what's another movie? Fierce Creatures, uh, a lot of the movie, early Jamie Lee Curtis movies, or um, the John Cleese movie, How to Irritate People. The producer of that is doing that movie. So these are all things that you can, elements you can get. And once you find a studio who's interested in doing that, they're going to want to pay for developing a movie. Usually it costs anything from 100K to a million dollars to commission a script from a screenwriter. So we call that development. So that's usually what that means is you're going to write a script. Scripts sometimes start in the stage of an outline, we call it, which is usually a one or two page document that just details the plot. It's just cheaper to write an outline. And that usually progresses down the road as you start talking to the studios more, you're talking to potential actors, you're talking to the writer more. Before you let him write the whole script, you then go into something called the treatment stage. OK, that's more like five to 10 pages, condensed script. And then finally, to first draft. And this is going to go through various iterations until we finally go to what we call a shooting script. OK, so that's development. Second. It's going to go into production when everybody is happy with the script. Perhaps through talking with creative artist agency, or Liam Morris Endeavor, or United Talent Agency, you've managed to find the director, you find the lead actress and the lead actor. You're ready to start casting the whole movie and, getting, and setting, it, setting it onto a schedule for release. Then you go into production. We call that a green lighting process. So when a movie is green lit, by the studio, that means the studio is happy with how the film has developed, how the talent attachments have come together. And they're going to set it for production, which means that they're going to put a lot of money into it, and they're going to start putting it on a time deadline to shoot and to release. So I'll just really quickly then on this side go over what green lighting really means and how a studio thinks when they green light a movie. So why do they call it green lighting? I don't know. There's a the really most annoying thing about the film industry is they use all this really weird lingo, which sometimes green lighting, in my view, it just means saying yes. Sorry. Yeah, just one quick question. Um, among the or within the development process, the only party involved is the producer or already the big studios. Um, that's a good question. So if you're a producer who's like David Ellison, the son of Larry Ellison, you have a company called Skydance that has two hundred million dollars in your account. You're going to want to develop your own material on your own money without approaching a studio. Because when you've developed it yourself, you own the property, you have much more say in that matter. It's a cleaner process, less cooks in the kitchen. And when you t take it to the studio for green lighting, you can dictate the deal on your own terms. Now, if you're a producer who's just, maybe you're, you know how to put a movie together, you know how to run the production, and you just happen to have found a good material, you don't want to be spending your own money your own money to develop something. The reason being that that's too much risk. 300K is the annual salary of, it's pretty good annual salary. That is the price of a, a average mid-level writer 
writing a script for you. So usually you wouldn't want to pay for that yourself. You'll then do what we call sh a shopping it to the studios and then you do a deal where they pay for the development. Now as a studio, as a bank, if you think about it, banks pay for or loan to companies all the time, but they don't want to be managing the company itself. So studios are fairly happy hiring a producer and then paying for the development of one of his projects. Because in their mind, that means they don't have to do any of, any of that. And it's a slow and painful process for many people to be developing things because a script is like a, is like a human body. You, when something goes wrong with this part of the body, you can't just cut it out because that's going to affect how the other parts of the body go. So if you don't like the ending of the script, if you just change it, that changes how you're going to have to write the beginning too. So that's the annoying thing about development. So back to green lighting. Okay, so a studio is usually going to look at three points. Okay, what is the budget of the movie? What is the, we call this WB, worldwide box office that they project for this movie? And they're going to look at the issue of dating. Okay. Dating the movie. When do they want this movie to be released? We all know the explosion of digital platforms like Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, YouTube, in China, Aichi, Tencent, Tencent Video, Yoku. The reason why these have been so successful is because it allows people to watch movies anytime. And the reason why studios um, have been, let's say, struggling to really compete against the digital platforms is because when you date them, the, their business model is to release films in a very, very wide basis and have them compete against, on average, 30 other movies, let's say if you're in North America, 30 other movies that are also being released at the same time. So if, you're in, if it's Christmas, there are going to be a lot of movies being released at the same time to take advantage of the large crowd, crowds of people going into the theater. So you're going to be competing against 29, potentially, other big releases that are going on right now. Whereas in the digital world, you're really competing against every single movie that's ever existed. But that's a liberating process for the, for the digital platforms because they, need, they can rely on the fact that people with very strong intent to find content will go out and find it. So they look at these few things. So I'll let you know, generally, it's going to be a low budget movie, mid budget movie, or high budget movie. So a high budget movie is usually called in Hollywood lingo, it's called a tentpole. Okay, I'll tell you, uh, I'll go into why it's called a tentpole. So a low budget movie could be anything from literally 10K to 10 million US. As we all know, Blair Witch Project was made for $10,000 and that grossed 200 million worldwide. This is why it's still a very lucrative business to be making micro budget movies. Um, 10 million is usually considered a, the threshold for a low budget movie in the studio world. In the independent world, when we mean independent is movies that are produced outside of the studios. Um, 10 million is considered a big budget film. So a mid budget, of course, would be around for anywhere from 10 to 50 million. Okay. Um, has anyone seen um, Hacksaw Ridge? Hacksaw Ridge was made for $40 million. Uh, it's considered a mid-budget movie. Now, high-budget movies, anything from $50 million to $100 plus million. The reason why they're called tentpoles um, is the average amount of movies a studio releases a year, I said, is about 15 to 20. Okay, if you look at the statistics of how successful movies are on average, uh, I'll say it this way, the average cash on cash uh, ratio for a studio, the big six and mini majors included, cash on cash, which means all the film expenditure plus operation expenditure compared to the revenue coming in is 1.1. That's average for a studio. 10%. Okay. 10%. Okay. I don't know what's that compared to other businesses, but that is low in, in, my, in my view. In last year, the highest performing studio actually did 1.1, and that was Disney. The second highest, Universal, did, I, I won't write it, did 1.08, that was Universal. Paramount did 0.89 last year, so they actually lost money. So that's average how a studio does. So if you look at that, what does that mean for the 15, 20 movies out there? Very few of them make money, right? Very few of them make money. So why 
is a high budget movie called a tentpole then. Not because it's a high budget movie necessarily, it's because they bet big on that movie. So if you look at, this is a chart for, let's say if this is revenue, and this is, um, th these are just all individual movies, the average revenue, if this is mu plus, minus, so let's say if this is negative profit and this is high profit, the average movie is going to be right around here, right? So this is like 1.1 cash on cash ratio. And then occasionally you get a hit, right? Let's say Blair Witch Project. But on the most cases, that, those hits are not going to be smaller movies because there's a higher risk of smaller movies getting more viewers. The, the expectation from the studios is that this kind of revenue is going to come from Mission Impossible or it's going to come from Avengers or it's going to come from Avatar or if it's going to come from uh, you know, other movies that are usually branded, very expensive movies. So that's why the expensive ones are tent, called tent poles because what it does is support the entire, entire tent that is the studio. It's a hit driven market uh, to be making movies because you want to bet big on movies that attract a large amount of audiences so that you can pay for the rest of these guys. So that's the whole business of studio filmmaking. But one can arguably say that is the reason why their cash on cash is at best 1.1. There is, of course, like problems in how studios are run, and that's why you see the success of digital platforms. You see, see the success of individual producers sometimes forming their own companies. I'll give you one example. Does, are there any horror fans here? Uh, uh, people like watching horror movies. Insidious, anyone see Insidious? Um, you watched Insidious? OK. Uh, Paranormal Activity. Um, uh, you're frowning. You're not into that kind of stuff. Okay. Those, uh, Paranormal Activity, uh, what's that other movie with Ethan Hawke in it? Um, oh god, um, the last one called uh, It, uh, Annabelle, Those, these movies that I mentioned are all made by the same company, same producer, called Jason Blum, called Blumhouse Productions. He's an individual pr producer and he's been incredibly profitable, more profitable, uh, better cash on cash than the studios. One man having a better, higher cash on cash. So in any case, they're going to look at the budget. Okay, so they know immediately: Are we going to? Is this going to be a tentpole that we bet big on? Which, by the way, of the 15 to 20 movies, they are on average only released four to five tentpoles because you're betting on average 100 plus million dollars on this movie. Star Trek, the last one, which uh, I invested in when I was at Alibaba, cost 220 million dollars to make. 220 million dollars. That's a I don't know, maybe it's not, that's not a lot of money to some of you because if you're, if you're in analyzing, like, I don't know, the, uh, uh, medical com companies, pharmaceuticals, that's probably just very, very insignificant. But worldwide box office, okay? Worldwide box office. This is something that the studios care a lot about, how this movie can sell. And I'll tell you roughly, I'm going to get rid of dating because um, we'll talk about that later. So what contributes to the box office of a movie? On average... The box office of a studio movie is 30% theatrical, almost 40%. Um, we call this the ancillary revenue streams. And this includes TV, digital, and home video. Okay. Star Trek sold 90 million in DVDs. Okay, 90 million in just in home video alone, DVD and, and Blu-rays. And then of course, 30% in merch, or uh, we call this, uh, or just theme parks. Okay, so if you go to Universal Studios, you know, there's Jurassic Park, there's Terminator, there's all of these, these film themed rides there that license to the theme park the rights to develop a ride that is branded with the movie's brand and then there'll be a profit sharing of ticket sales to that um, to that ride so the, okay 30 percent theatrical and it's almost 70 percent something other stuff this is how worldwide box office will compose and so when a studio looks at a movie like harry potter they're going to be looking at how much how much theater tickets can we sell with this and how many people are willing to buy this or pay for it on their home television screens or on their computers 
and also what can this spawn outside of the movie in itself. So for example, Cars, this Disney movie, made almost $900 million in merchandising worldwide. That's a staggering amount. This is why Disney is continuously the top of the big six studios is because they have higher success in exploiting this 30%. For them, this could probably be 50% of all of their revenue. So on average, okay, a movie worldwide, a mid to high budget movie, on average worldwide, does anyone know the average amount of money it makes uh, theatrically? Any, guess, any guesses? On average, a mid-budget movie. OK, so I, I won't um, deal with low-budget movies. They're, they're really kind of a, a, uh, a, a wild card here. For mid-budget movies worldwide, they make, on average, 77 million. Theatrical, OK, box office. Now, for a temple, they make usually on average 120 million. Why is this number so low? It's because a lot of temples do poorly. And you're seeing this, this is the Hollywood crisis now. Their studios are betting big on tent poles that are not actually making that much money. Now, let's look at a particular case study. So, um, has anyone, so, so we've all seen Dunkirk? Is that movie some, some few have seen? Um, that's a recent Warner Brothers movie directed by Chris Nolan. So Dunkirk, I'm forgetting the numbers. I think it made 550 million worldwide. Let's just say that it made 550 million worldwide. Does somebody have a calculator, by the way? Um, can somebody ready a calculator? Because I'm not very good at math. I'm really sorry. Um, so this was the w, the worldwide box office of Dunkirk. Okay. How much money are you actually making as a studio from that? Okay, so on average, the way distributors deal with theaters is we sign a contract with the distributor. We say, uh, sorry, sorry, the, the, the distributor signs a contract with the theater. Say you are going to give me this and this many screens to show my movie, and we're going to you're going to give me what percentage of the box office sales you have for that movie. So for a smaller movie, it's harder to get a theater to play it because they're going to think there's an opportunity cost to committing a screen to this smaller movie because I'm losing that opportunity to show it on a big movie, to commit that screen for a big movie. So usually they're going to charge more to act uh, and they're going to keep more of the ticket sale to themselves. So for every single ticket sold, they're likely to, in, to keep 70 to even 80% of that ticket price for themselves. But for a big big tentpole like Dunkirk, that number, okay, so we're going to call this, I'm using Hollywood lingo here, so please, please bear with me, because I know you're all going to be future producers and you're going to want to be, you know, armed against Hollywood technoblabble, okay? We call this theatrical rentals. The reasons why it's called theatrical rentals is because they actually used to rent um, the negative, film negative, to theaters to use while they're showing the movie. So usually for this, it is anywhere from 40 to 51% of ticket sales. Okay. Dunkirk, because it was distributed by Warner Brothers, they have a worldwide deal with most exhibitors for this number to be 45. So that means Warner Brothers is going to be getting 45% of this number. So what is that? Can, can somebody do it? Calculate that for me. Two forty. Can we just say two forty? Okay. So, what is that? That is called the gross receipts. Okay. So theatrical rentals is just another word uh, for the box office. That's just how much business it does, and you get forty to fifty-one percent of that. 45%, which Warner gets, the amount of money you get from ticket sales accounted to the studio, that's called gross receipts. Okay? That, so Warner Brothers got probably within this ballpark for Dunkirk. You may think that's a lot of money, but then what happens when you release a movie? You pay for print ads, ads. you pay for digital banners, you pay for the talent to fly first class to every single major city and promote the, uh, promote the movie. You're going to pay for television ads. And if you're an at Avengers movie, you're going to pay for a Super Bowl placement, usually. And th usually that costs anywhere from 10 to $20 million. 
And some, and maybe if you're um, a Star, the Star Trek, they, well, we hired Rihanna to do a song for her, the last Star Trek movie. That cost us $30 million cool. just to do that one song. Yeah, it's called Sledgehammer. You can even you, uh, YouTube it. Okay, so when you get the gross receipts, the first thing the distributor is going to do is charge you, and by you I mean the filmmaker, the producer, okay, whoever's financing the movie outside of the studio. Let's say if you're a TPG or you're like a, you're, you in the future are financing a movie like Dunkirk with Warner Brothers. They pay for 50% of it, you pay for 50% of it. Since they're the distributor, they get this amount of gross receipts. Now they're going to minus prints and ads from that because they pay for that out of pocket. So the average print ad, let's say on a billboard by, let's say, Highway X, if you're in New England, is going to cost about 2,000 US dollars per hour to rent. Okay, that adds up after a while. Okay, I'll tell you for a fact, because I have friends at Warner Brothers, that Dunkirk cost $180 million to market. That's scary, isn't it? That's really, really scary. I'll tell you why China has become such a big theatrical market and why the studios really care about China. Because when I released uh, Star Trek Beyond in China, I'm not bragging, okay? This is just, the, this is just market price in China. When I released Star Trek Beyond, I, I spent $5 million to release it in China. Because you don't need print ads here, right? Why would you pay for a print ad in Sunli Tun when I, let's say, I am Alibaba, I can commit a digital banner on the head of Taobao or Alipay for free, right? So that, that is, this, this is coming later in the talk. So, so it costs $180 million. So then you're left with what we call adjusted GR, adjusted gross receipts, okay? Uh, $60 million. Okay, now what gets subtracted next? How much it costs to make the movie, right? Now you're going to then subtract the negative costs of producing the picture. I don't know why it's called the negative cost. I would just say it's just the cost of the picture, but they just had to say it like that. But um, Dunker cost $100 million. Cost hundred million dollars exactly. So from the theatrical alone, we're negative forty million here. So, but you don't have to freak out because Warner Brothers did. I think almost it's, it hasn't been released in DVDs yet. But Warner Brothers internally is projecting it to make forty million dollars from DVDs, and then it's going to probably not do much in merch, but it's going to do something on digital because either Netflix or Amazon is going to swoop in and pay either twenty or thirty million dollars just for worldwide rights. In any case, you see, Dunkirk is such a, such a, I think it's a creatively successful movie. But it's not making Warner Brothers a lot of money. It's really not making them a lot of money. And then you look at a movie, movies that may make money from this kind of ratio. You really see that it's either Avatar, or it's either the Avengers, or it's either something that is superhero oriented, or it's a potentially a low budget hit. But then I'll give the average amount of movies that make it for the low budget range. The average amount of movies that actually make money in low budget is even worse than mid budget in tent poles. So this is a crazy, crazy business, financially speaking. In any case, uh, we were in the green line process. They're going to look at the worldwide box office and they're going to do a back of the napkin calculation like that. Okay? And then the dating, of course. They're going to be looking at the competition for the release of Dunkirk. Um, I'll give you one example of where dating really becomes an issue. Uh, you guys watch movies here, Chinese movies? You ever try to watch a Chinese movie or sit through one? Um, in uh, August 1st, uh, they released two major movies in China. Called, one was called Wolf Warrior Two, and one was called Founding of the Army. Jian Jun Da Ye and um, uh, and Zhan um, Long R. Okay, these two movies were released together on August 1st. Wolf Warrior Two made 55.6 billion RMB. And the other movie only made 300 million. Okay, so as two movies both talking about the greatness of the Chinese army and military action, 
the fact that two run into each other on the exact same date is highly risky for both of them. Right? It's highly risky for both of them. Now, so you may ask, why did the two, distribu the two dis different distributors of those two movies decide to date the movie on August 1st? That's because August 1st is the celebration of the founding of the Chinese army. We call it Ba Yi Jian Jun Jie. Right? They thought that that was the right time to be releasing a movie talking about the Chinese army because that is a date like, I'll give you another example, Independence Day was released on Memorial Day. Um, the, second in, uh, the first Independence Day was released on Independence Day. 2012, that disaster movie was literally released on December 12th. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll do stuff like that because you think it's topical and it's within the conversation. Now, the problem is that always results in competition and one fails and some prevail. Uh, the explanation as to why Wolf Warrior II beat founding of the army so, so much often is articulated this way. A lot of people would say, uh, and this comes from the head of Sarft, he says, you look at a film that celebrates how powerful China is now compared to a film that asks you to not forget how much your forefathers suffered. That first movie is probably going to do a little bit better than the second movie because it's forward-looking, it's positive, it's affirmative. The other movie is kind of like remembering, remember how much your father suffered. So, so there's always going to be an issue of dating. So with these three different considerations, a studio will choose to either greenlight a movie or shelve it for later. And studios do this all the time. So they made a, a, accumulated about two to three million dollars in development costs for the picture. You may ask why so high. Well, you have to hire a writer. Maybe if you don't like him, you need to hire someone else to rewrite it. You need to hire a director to at least oversee the development before it shoots. They're going to then make that judgment after a certain time whether that much money is enough or they need more or there's no way they think that movie's going to ever work. So they're going to either green light it or they're either going to shelve it. So that's kind of the distribution and film financing business here. Thank you.